Hello everybody. So let's talk about some soil classification. So with the idea of classification, really we want to uh, organize our knowledge of soils. So just trying to put soils together that are um, similar, uh, similar in uh, look, similar in properties, and are going to respond to uh, the type of management that we do in similar fashion. We also want uh, to be able to figure out what's important about the soil or what's important within the soil or what are the important properties within the soil why why group these together so what what about these soils should make them a group and and the easiest way to think about that is what what are the properties within the soil that make them the same uh, the hard part about that is soil properties change slowly with distance along the ground so sometimes um, sometimes it's it's obvious sometimes it's not very obvious there's no sharp boundaries and there's no real big cutoff point so we've got to kind of just figure it out and we've got to come up with a classification system that that works for us and so the one that we've come up with is soil taxonomy it's got six categories or level with our uh, highest uh, level being order and our lowest level being series uh, order is going to be based on diagnostic horizon. So what that um, really means just simply is that there's a, a specific uh, par um, a property of the horizon that makes it this way. And it's got a sh sh really strong evidence of that. Then we have sub order, which is going to be based on the soil moisture re regime. Uh, we got great group and subgroup, which are going to be based on the presence or absence of certain horizons or properties. Uh, then we have family based on texture, mineralogy, uh, clay activity, where we're really talking about that cation exchange capacity, and then the soil temperature regime of subsoil horizons. And then we get all the way down to series, which is a wide set of properties, and it's, it's going to be named for the local community where it was first described. So that's why you hear things like Bakersfield, Wasco, Granoso, Delano as, as series names. Uh, when we start at that highest level with order, we get down to just 12. There's 12 soil orders in the whole world. When we're at the series level, there's over 25,000 series uh, in in the world. So it's we go from from very few categories, just 12 of them, to quite a wide array of categories because soils can be so different in all the different places that you go. So here's a look at those 12 soil orders, and we will look at this again later on in this lecture. But just to give you an idea, we go from less developed soils to highly developed soils, and we've got our 12 different orders there. And you can see that they they look very different, but not only do they look very different, when you actually read through these descriptions, they're pretty uh, different. You go from something like an aridosol, where it says dry desert conditions, to a gelosol, which is permafrost conditions, to an inceptosol, not much bee horizon, andosol, volcanic mild weathering, mollusol, soft, dark, semi-arid, moist grasslands. It's all very different. It's all easily easy to understand at least when we think about it in this way but it's not all it's it's not always that way right the soil soils don't just stay the same and they don't have just these perfect layers and it's just this soil all the time right it's this layer then it's another layer then it's another layer and so we get these mixtures so we do our best to to try and classify all those soils and go get it down to the simplest of forms and orders but then also when we really want to know everything about the soil, we're down at that series level where we're going to have a big, long name attached to it. But that big, long name is going to tell us all the important properties of that soil. And so here's a look at um, both the nation and California. Uh, Bakersfield, we're, you know, we're down there um, just north of the um, of the real southern part of the state and uh, we actually will fall um, most of Bakersfield falls into um, the aridosol uh, order and then with um, with uh, lots of different classifications uh, under that idea of aridosols and you can see throughout the um, throughout the United States it's quite a quite a mixed bag aridosols and tosols mollusols ultasols uh, alpha sols, just all, you know, uh, lots of things spread all over the place. So how do you actually do this? How do you classify a soil? Well, you're going to need a morphological description, which we learned how to do earlier. You'll probably need some lab data, 
And then you're going to try and uh, identify the diagnostic soil horizon because if we figure out that diagnostic soil horizon, that gets us down to a 1 out of 12 um, where we need to figure it out. And that's that's great because if we can get down to figuring out, all right, which one of these 12 is it, that's much easier than which one of these 25,000 is it. Uh, so once we figure out that diagnostic horizon that we can base our classification off of, then we'll figure out our soil order. Then we can figure out our soil moisture re regime. And when we figure that out, that's going to tell us our suborder. And then we use um, the keys to soil taxonomy, which you can see a copy of right there. Um, we're going to do that to key out the lower categories and figure out the, the great group and the subgroup and the, and the family and the series and to where we get down to all the way down to the series. And then we have all this nice information that tells us about what we want to know about that um, soil that we're looking at. So I think the next question would have to be, what is a diagnostic horizon and, and how do we figure that out? Because that's, that's what we're saying the first step in that process is. Well, diagnostic horizon is the result of distinctive soil formation process. And what does that mean? It means that it's something that is very obvious and it's, and it, it's, it's very distinctive and compared to other ones. So the book gives two examples. It gives an argillic horizon, which is a clay enriched horizon that formed by the movement of clay from upper to lower horizons. So that happens within certain soils. But then it also gives an example of a mollic horizon, which is formed by an accumulation of organic matter near the soil surface. And so mol mollusols are going to come from a mollic horizon. And because it, they're formed by an accumulation of organic matter, now tying in some of that knowledge we've got from before, that means those soils are going to be really dark. A uh, clay enriched horizon with the clay moving from um, upper to lower layers, we're probably thinking not definitely not going to be as dark as a as a mollusol because we're not talking we're talking about clay we're not talking about organic matter but then if we're talking about clay we're going to think about some of those properties like we're going to think about the idea that it's probably going to hold water really well and it's not um it's gonna it's gonna have um, those sorts of properties to it that we think of when we think of clay as opposed to um, when we think of of a mollusol and a mollic horizon, we're not really thinking. Well, is what are we talking about? Sand or silt? Or we're with an argillic horizon. We're specifically talking about clay. So that that kind of um, that that really sends us off on starts our our thinking on. Okay, well we know this about this soil, or we know this about this soil, and really kind of um, starts that that idea of what's what's the important parts of this soil. And then it's also important because we talked about horizons before. And so if you're sitting there going, well, what's the difference between like when you classify a horizon from before versus this idea of a diagnostic horizon? And the idea is the idea of some evidence of it versus strong evidence of it. And so if you take that first example, which is the argillic horizon from above, that would be classified as a BT horizon, right? We'd see it in the, um, in the, um, uh, subsoil because we're talking about the idea that the clay moved from the upper to the lower levels so we'd see it in the subsoil so that's why it's a B and then the lowercase t is that idea of an argillic horizon but now the difference between that what just any BT horizon versus an actual diagnostic horizon is that it's got to have strong evidence that this is the overwhelming uh, thing that's happening not just that there might be a little bit of it happening. So it's the idea of some evidence versus strong ev evidence. So not all BT horizons are considered argillic horizons, that this diagnostic horizon. But anything that is an argillic horizon, anything that is a diagnostic horizon, would definitely be classified as BT. And so it's just the idea that, um, that it has to have strong evidence that this is the definite soil formation, this distinctive soil formation process that's happening right here. And so when we go then to determine our soil order, that's based on our diagnostic horizon, and soil orders are going to occur, occur in broad zones, like we looked at the map of the U.S. and saw kind of how broad um, some of these zones can be. Uh, and it's going to de uh, depend largely on the climate and organisms when we think about our five factors of soil formation. Um, 
andesols, histosols, and vertisols, those three out of the 12 soil orders are actually different because they depend more on the parent material uh, soil formation factor instead of the climate and organism soil formation factor. So let's look at those 12 soil orders with a brief description and the diagnostic horizon that makes it so. And so we talked about uh, argillic horizons, and so that would lead us to alpha sols, and it says soils with a subsoil accumulation of clay moderately weathered, which makes sense because we know if you have an argillic horizon, an argillic horizon has that evidence of the uh, clay moving from the upper to the lower levels. So then the idea that alpha sols have a subsoil with an accumulation of clay that makes sense and now that tells us a whole lot about what's going on already and we can start getting a picture of maybe what that's going to look like uh in our head if we if we um you know dig a soil pit and look at that uh soil whereas something um like we'll see around here iridosols it says um soils of arid environments and then it says a natric horizon and so and so natric is similar to argillic and it's going to have that um, similar idea of the the subsoil accumulation of clay but then it also has the idea as built in of it that it's got a specific um, structure to the to the um, to the soil it's got that columnar or prismatic or blocky uh, type of soil to it and then also specifically um, with the cation exchange capacity it's got um, high amount of um, exchangeable sodium and so there's all sorts of different um, re reasons as to how these things form with something like the gelosols it's it the diagnostic horizon is permafrost so anything that's a gelosol is going to be soils in very cold regions that are regions that have permanently frozen layers with uh, mollusols we talked about that earlier before that mollic horizon that thick dark surface horizon that's going to be full of organic matter um, that's going to end up as a mollusol and so it just depends on where you go and what you've got going on because you can see even something when you go down to an ultasol that's also an argillic horizon and you're like but it's got to be something distinct but then you read and it says soils with the subsoil accumulation of clay that are highly weathered so it's also so they also have that accumulation of clay but they're just older soils that have been weathered quite a lot whereas the alpha sols are going to be a little bit younger soils and so it once you start getting used to these terms you can really start even though these words seem like they're complicated they they tell you a lot about what you're looking at and what you're dealing with already and then you know you can look at it at the way of you're trying to figure out what's happening with your soils um so you need to figure this out but then also let's look at it the other way because a lot of this work has already been done for us already so really what we're doing is you know we're clicking on an area in some sort of a mapping um a soil mapping uh uh app whether we're using soil web or web soil survey or or something else and all this information is already available to us we just have to be able to to read it and understand what it means when we see that it it's, it gives us this whole long name and we're like well, what does that mean well it tells us a whole lot about that soil we just have to be able to to um put together the pieces so to speak so here's a, a simplified key another way to look at it to where you can start off um, with number one here and then work your way down so if you have soils with permafrost oh well my soils aren't permafrost okay well do your soils have a ton of organic matter no they don't have a ton of organic matter okay keep going um as acidic forest soils well they're not uh in there's not a lot of forest here okay well it's not that soils formed in volcanic ash well nope that's not really us either intensely weathered soils of tropical and subtropical environments well we don't have a tropical environment keep going clay soils with a high shrink soil capacity no we don't really have that either soils of arid environments with subsurface horizon development we got that aerosols look at that boom and we stop and so that's a it's a super simplified key but it's a nice easy way to kind of figure out what what it is you're dealing with and and a quick way to get there and once we figure out the soil order we can start putting together the other pieces as well so um, when we're talking about the oops there you go made myself disappear for a second but I'm back so 
um, with what we just talked about in terms of the soil orders. Right here on the upper right, I've posted a link here to the University of Idaho, and they've got a very descriptive uh, uh, website set up to uh, really dig into the 12 soil orders and show you pictures of it and give you big long descriptions of it. So if you want to pause the video right now and click on that link and check, it, check out those, um, those 12 soil orders, go ahead. And so breaking it down in terms of where are these uh, soil orders and, and what really are they. So in the eastern United States, you got spodosols and septosols, alphasols and ultasols. With spodosols, you're talking about um, sandy deposits under forest vegetation. So it's the Great Lakes areas, New England and Florida. Your inceptosols are going to be weaker developed soils on the steeper slopes of the Appalachian Mountains and floodplains of larger rivers like the Mississippi. Your alpha sols and ultasols are going to be in humid climates where rain translocates the clay through percolation and gets you that um, clay going from the upper levels to the lower levels. Because remember, both of those have argillic horizons, which is that clay moving from the upper level to the lower level. Your alpha sols are going to be formed on younger parent material um, that were deposited by the glaciers when that happened. Um, you're also going to see alpha sols um, in the Mississippi alluvial valley. So um, I've mentioned this uh, before, but uh, the uh, if you ever have gone down to the Mississippi alluvial valley, you're supposed to be going down and down and down, and then all of a sudden you kind of hit these hills, and you're like, where are these hills come from? And what it is is it's all this um, silt getting deposited uh, down the river, and and you end up with these hills, and through um, wind erosion and and um, and water erosion, just bringing all this material and ends up forming these hills, and that that those hills are called uh, lus, and that's um, that's how the Mississippi alluvial valley. Um, formed and so you're going to find uh alpha, that's that's where you'd find uh alpha sols uh that's one area specifically whereas ultasols older non-glaciated landscapes they're more leached due to time and chemical weathering so really your older landscapes before everything was frozen over and all that those ones are going to be ultasols in the western U.S., you've got your mollusols, which are going to be found on grasslands in the Great Plains, the Columbian Plateau, and the Prairie Peninsula, which is a stretch from Iowa, Illinois, and western Indiana, where the Great Plains kind of extends. And so that's, remember, mollusols are going to have that higher organic content, really dark soils. Aridosols, your range and basin areas in the drier parts of the Great Plains, as well as, of course, the drier parts of the Central Valley as well, because that's what we have here. Your entosols are soils with very little development, so you're going to find that in steep areas and floodplains or areas where you get a lot of erosion because the soil keeps moving and moving and moving, and that's why you have soils with very little development. And then our gelosols, which are our permafrost, which are going to be permanently frozen soil horizons. That's how we define permafrost. And um, we're going to see those mostly in Alaska. Let's slide myself over here. So unique formations due to parent materials. We said there were three soils that didn't really go with the idea of specific climate and organisms. It was more based on their parent material. So that's histosols, which are organic soils in shallow lakes and swamps. So the lake states, so the Great Lakes area, the Florida and the Mississippi Delta, you'll find some histosols. Your vertisols are formed uh, formed by certain uh, formed uh, with certain minerals that shrink and swell, and you're going to see that a lot in Texas. And then your andesols, which are formed on volcanic deposits, so you can see that a lot in the Pacific Northwest. Think like Mount St. Helens, Mount Lassen area for um, those of us in California. Those areas are going to have uh, andesols. And so we're back here again with these twelve soil orders, and really just kind of hopefully um, having this make a little more sense, this idea of uh, less developed soils to more highly developed soils. And, and really, um, we can even think about the idea of younger soils versus just way older soils and soils that have been really, really weathered. Um, that's that highly developed versus the, the less highly developed. And so um, you can just see where those um, where these different soils come into play. So our aridosols that we have here, dry desert conditions that kind of make sense uh, for for Bakersfield uh, when you really think about it, uh, versus some of these uh, other um, 
other areas. And when I look at the soil in my yard, just looking at this picture and, and thinking about the erythosols, uh, I'm like, yeah, I can kind of see it. But, you know, not everywhere is going to give you that perfect um, perfect lining up. And and the idea of, um, you know, soils changing and having all the different layers in between, not everything is going to look perfectly the way it does on this picture yet you might still have it still come from the, um, the same uh, order. So in terms of our suborders, I'm going to slide myself back over here again. So suborders are going to be based on your soil moisture regime, regime, which is going to be a representation of moisture conditions in a soil profile during an average year. It's going to be based on your regional climates, except if it's an aquic uh, soil suborder and um, your, so your soil moisture regime really affects your soil formation, the use and management of the soils, and it's good for, it's good for grouping because it, it's really easy for us to come up with just a few categories to make it make sense. And so if we look at the categories, we've got aquic, that's the one that we said isn't going to be dictated by um, climate. What it's dictated by is uh, high water tables. It's controlled by landscape depression or impermeable layers. So you got either depression where the land's low that the water table's high or the idea that you, um, that you have impermeable layers. The other ones are going to be controlled by climate. So udic is humid climates, oustic, semi-arid climates, xeric is a Mediterranean climate, and aridic is a desert climate. So we're going to see these terms come up when we uh, get to the idea of the um, of the suborder. Uh, also here on the right, so you can see our suborders, or our suborders, or our soil moisture regimes, whichever way you want to think about it, going from drier to wetter. And then also we'll see this later on um, when we're talking about families, but soil temperature regimes, the idea of going from uh, hotter to colder. And so here's a look at our soil moisture regimes. So you can see we get kind of um, typic aridic uh, out here in uh, in Bakersfield as opposed to something like uh, udic for a lot of the eastern United States or um, the aquic these aquic areas, um, which makes sense for the uh, for the eastern United States, right on the on the borders and on the uh, Mississippi Valley area here. You can also see that aquic area for our San Francisco Bay areas, our delta areas up in the uh, upper part of the Central Valley. So in California, here's a here's a more uh, more close up look at California. We've got our aquic areas. Um, which are the the delta areas, and then you can see Udic, Ustic, and you can see um, they classify us uh, more xeric, um, but you know xeric, aridic. I think it kind of depends on exactly uh, where you would fall on this map, um, but those you know really really dry conditions. So in terms of the nomenclature, so uh, trying to really understand the words that we're that we're gonna see when we're um, seeing the description of the soil or um, the the soil classification, the whole soil taxon taxonomic name or taxonomic classification. A few rules to kind of remember. Bam, got him. Uh, the 12 orders all end in SOL, S-O-L. Um, it, it, there is, depending on where you're at it might get a little more complicated than that but the the 12 specific soil orders do all end in salt now you might get something where the the name doesn't end in that uh typical soil order but you you can figure out which soil order it it find it does fall into with a little bit of googling or just a little bit of extra knowledge a sub order is going to have two syllables and the last syllable is going to belong to the order uh, that it belongs to. So it's going to have a uh, part of the order name within the last syllable. A great group is going to consist of a prefix added to a suborder name. So there's going to be a prefix and then the suborder name. And then a subgroup is uh, formed by adding an adjective as a separate word to the great group name. And then a family name is designated by modifiers that are going to describe the particle size distribution, the mineralogy, the clay activity, which we said was that CEC, the cation exchange capacity, and then the temperature. And then the series name, we said, is going to be named for the, the locality in which the soil was first described. 
Does that totally make sense to you? Maybe not, but let's kind of put it together. So let me just move myself out of the way so you can see this clearly. So here is an example. And we want we want to also go over the idea that we can figure out the important soil properties from the name. So if the name is fine, smectitic, mesic, typic, argiustal, we're sitting there going, what does that mean? But we have actually learned about all this stuff. So um, molasol is is our order, and because we see this all within the um, within the name there, that's how we get our our suborder or our order. Our suborder is our ustal, which we said um, that idea of the um, the order would be the uh, the last syllable in that two syllable name. So we got oost all, so that all takes us back to our order, right? And so now our great group is our RG ustal, and our subgroup is our typic RG ustal, and then our family fine, smectitic, mesic, typic RG ustal. So now I'm going to go back a slide here because I really want you guys to um, get this idea. So now remember, the 12 orders all end in sol. So we figured out we had our, our OLL that tells us it's a, it's a molosol, and molosol ends in SOL. A suborder, right? So let's go forward here. So our suborder is ustal, right? So a suborder name has two syllables, the last syllable being the order that it belongs to. So that O-L-L, -L, that tells us it's a molosol. And then the oost tells us, um, tells us the, the soil moisture regime, which is oostic, which is, um, tells us it's the idea, the idea of a semi-arid climate. And so we've got, it's a, it's a molosol, so we know now trying to add that important soil properties to it. So it's a mollusol, so we know it's probably a grassland area. We know that it's going to have a um, heavy amount of organic matter. It's going to be a dark looking soil and it's going to be a semi-arid climate. So that's what we figured out so far just by looking at the name. Now let's go back to the great group, RG Ustal. So now being that we kind of talked about that earlier, we know the idea of RG means that there's an argillic horizon there, which is that idea that it's got the um, the clay moving from um, from upper to lower levels. So we know it's, a, it's probably a grassland soil, heavy organic matter content, it's semi-arid climate, it's got an argillic horizon, Typic, so it's um, so it's going to be typical of what we would expect, and then we get down to the family. So fine, so what the, our particle size is fine. So um, we we think about our our particles in terms of um, our fine, medium grain, or coarse. So these are going to be more fine textured soils. Smectitic, so it's going to have one of it's going to have that two to one um, kind of clay. Um, clay uh, content to it and then the um, the cation exchange capacity is going to have be within a um, uh, specific range that would be related to that idea of smectitic and then the idea of um, of mesic in terms of um, of the temperature range which I would just kind of describe as kind of mild uh, temperatures so fine smectitic mesic typic RG stall it sounds complicated, but we actually know a whole bunch of information if we understand uh, these names and what they mean and what they can tell us. And your book does a great job of having a bunch of different tables uh, that really can help you um, with those different uh, those different um, prefixes and the different little names and adjectives and and what they actually mean. And if that doesn't work. Um, just Googling some of these words like typic or smectitic, you're going to come up with some answers as well. And then um, tying it all together by, you know, being able to look at a soil series or looking at a mapping like a web soil survey or a soil web and being able to then say, well, here's my area and these are the soils in my area and here's the name of that, this soil. So this means that I've got this, 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 and this as the important properties of my soil. That's what we're really looking for in terms of the idea of soil classification. And that's what I got for you. So I hope uh, that works. And if you got questions, you can always ask.